Welcome to AADT 4120, Serious Gaming and Simulations. Week 8, Needs and Task Analysis, Video Clip 1 of 3. I'm Professor Bill Kapralos, and over the next few minutes, we will briefly examine instructional design. However, prior to doing so, here's the list of analysis questions for this particular video clip. Number 1. What is instructional design? Number 2. Why is instructional design not so popular within the gaming community? Number three, what does paralysis by analysis refer to? Number four, what are the three parts to instructional design? Let's briefly examine instructional design before we begin our discussion on needs and task analysis which essentially are a part of the instructional design process. Instructional design is the process of creating instruction through the analysis of learning needs and the systemic development of learning materials. Whether you're developing a serious game or a simulation for the military, health and safety purposes, or whether the serious game or the simulation is designed to provide some basic elementary or high school curriculum material, you will have to know about the content that you will be presenting and you'll have to know how to best present it. This is where instructional design comes into play. However, instructional design is a process that is not always popular within the game development industry. In a rush to get started in making a game, often with funding tied to delivery deadlines, dissatisfaction with the need to analyze the content and study the makeup of the target population before the game development process begins often arises. The instructional design process begins by determining our project goals. In other words, what is the purpose of the serious game or simulation that you are developing? We then gather content that will be placed into our serious game or our simulation and we organize the content so that it is instructionally effective, whether from the perspective of training, political persuasion, or marketing. And finally, we qualify our target audience. So essentially, instructional design is a three-phase process. First phase is the analysis of what the learning problem is. Second phase is the design of a solution to the problem. And finally, the third phase is the development to that solution. Just a note regarding instructional design. In many people's minds, game design and instructional design are the same thing, while in other people's minds, they are very different and at odds with each other. Some may even say that instructional design competes with and detracts from much of what game designers want to do. And just as an aside, a study carried out by the U.S. Navy in 2005 reports that empirical research does not make a compelling case for games as the preferred instructional method. Now, according to this report, instructional games aren't any more effective than any other methods of instruction. However, in the same report, it is stated that the situation has something to do with the lack of rigorous data collection and analysis on the part of the researchers in the field. The report also compelled the U.S. Army Research Institute to launch further studies designed to evaluate the value of instructional design in the game development process. Instructional games are largely devoid of instructional design, and thus serious games are rarely effective as they should be. So one cannot understate the importance of instructional design when it comes to developing serious games and simulations. Let's briefly examine where some of these negative feelings about instructional design amongst game developers and designers came about. Now, there are some valid reasons for the negative feelings that many game designers and developers have about instructional design. In the 1960s and in the 1970s, there was a very large movement where instructional design, performance problem solving, and various types of analyses were extremely popular, and there was a large hype associated with them within the training community. And the theories and practices associated with this movement came from applications of behavioral psychology and particularly the work of Skinner. Advocates of the approach were convinced that if you can define a behavior well enough, 
and reward it right away, you could teach that behavior or a set of behaviors to just about anyone. This particular era and the emphasis of behavioral change via rewards had a very negative effect on some of the experts in the, prof in the profession. Some believe they could teach whatever they were asked to teach to a predefined level of satisfaction. They would develop instruction that taught exactly what it said it would teach. However, when we look at the underlying principles of behavioral psychology, they don't necessarily apply to learning. And in general, many instructional designers forget about the design and development parts and focused only on the analysis part of the instructional design process. And this led to what's known as paralysis by analysis, or in other words, the turning away of many from instructional design. As mentioned, focus was placed on analysis only, and instructional designers would provide a 200-page list of everything that someone had to do to perform a specific job, but little else. And this really turned away many from instructional design. Of course, the analysis step is very important. If you don't identify all the steps in something you're trying to teach someone, if you don't specify criteria for performing those skills correctly, how do you figure out what to teach and how to teach it? The analysis phase also provides a rigorous framework for collecting data and an organized way of providing research material. But analysis should not be done to infinity. Given the past issues with instructional design, it tainted many game designers and developers' views on instructional design in general. They basically saw it as an endless and unproductive process and decided to keep the instructional designers out of the serious games development process altogether. Let's consider a f the following example. Imagine your client hands you a set of specifications for your application that details exactly what each player has to learn, the tasks each player has to perform within the game, and how well the players have to perform each task in order to succeed in the game and complete the game. If you had the above information, you would probably be confident that you could deliver an effective, serious game. The challenge would be to find interesting gameplay and to make the game fun while the learning occurs. Further imagine that the client gives you a document that showed you each steps that the player would have to go through in playing the game. The order in which the steps had to be taken, the worst case scenarios for failure, and the best case scenarios for success. If the above information was correct, once again, you would be confident of developing a successful serious game. Essentially, what was just described previously largely defines what you get from an instructional designer. If the client can't give you those specifications to the degree you need them, you need an instructional designer to do it for you. When the instructional design process is done properly, it provides the game developer and the designer a wealth of information. The result of the analysis will tell you exactly what you have to teach, or if a simulation or a game, the tasks that the player has to complete successfully to simulate the experience and learn the correct behavior. The results of the instructional design will tell you how to present that information in a way that will help the learner and the player understand. Once you know what you will want to teach and how you're going to teach it, you're at the point where you can begin the creative design process, or in other words, you can begin the game design process. As game developers, depending on the client, they may provide you with a detailed document that states what you are going to teach and how you are going to teach it, but this is not always the case, and you can't assume you will have that document. Of course, the better the analysis, the better the data that the game designers have to work with, hence the importance of the instructional design process. And an instructional designer to carry out the instructional design process if the game developers cannot do it themselves. Instructional design does more than just clarify the topic. It identifies certain instructional principles that can be used to help make the decisions during creative development. So in other words, what is the best order to present information? And creative designers are then informed when they are hashing out the elements of premises, business, and gameplay. Consider the following rule of thumb followed by serious games designers and developers Nick Iupa and Terry Borst. 
They never allow themselves or anyone working on that part of the project to think about creative solutions, story or gameplay or anything else until they have the content and the instructional principles fully defined. This ensures they don't start shaping the content to fit some story idea that they may have. This brings us to the end of the material for this particular video clip, but I'd like to point out two references where you may find further information regarding instructional design as it pertains to serious games and simulations. The first one is by Katrin Becker and Jim Parker, the Guide to Computer Simulations and Games. And the second one is by Nick Ayupa and Terry Borst, end to end game development, creating independent serious games and simulations for, from start to finish. And part of the material presented here was taken from these references. This also leads us to our list of synthesis questions. Number one, how do we incorporate instructional design without conflicting or interrupting the game design process? Number two, when designing a serious game, should instructional design come before game design? Does it matter? This is the end of this video clip. Thank you.